Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, folks, I think we have everything up and running again. Let's see if we can continue on. Um, the PowerPoint presentation from the webinar will be posted on our website, lgc.org, under the Events tab. That's the direct link to the webinars page on the bottom of your screen. And then we'll also have a recording of the webinar online, and it should be a very interesting one considering our uh, technical difficulties today. Uh, next slide. Okay, when the webinar concludes, you'll be asked to complete a survey. Um, please take five minutes to provide us with your input, which will help us continue to create useful resources for you in the future. Next. Uh, here's our agenda for today. Obviously, we're going to uh, sort of try and move things along quickly here. Um, you can see who our speakers are. First, James Rojas, founder of the design-based urban planning initiatives called Place It. We'll discuss model building workshops and on-site interactive models. And then our second speaker will be Claudia Corchado, program manager for the Central California Regional Obesity Prevention Program for Merced County who will discuss participation tools with a focus on youth engagement and leadership development. Then our third speaker will be Hector Rojas from the City of Richmond, who will discuss innovative te techniques used to engage the community um, in the city's general plan update process. Next. I had planned to go into some detail uh, about why we should engage residents in the planning process. However, considering our time, I think um, we can just review what's on the slide here, uh, that engagement debunks myths and clarifies misunderstanding, uh, promotes an educated citizenry, ensures good, long-lasting plans, expedites the development process, improves the quality of planning, and enhances trust. I think for all the folks listening in, um, we understand very clearly why engagement is important. Next slide. A bit about the guidebook. In 1995, the Local Government Commission published a guidebook that outlined the reasons for public engagement that I just mentioned. Uh, the guidebook also discussed tools and techniques to achieve successful public engagement. It was a groundbreaking resource, which the American Planning Association distributed for over 10 years. Through a recent grant with the California Endowment, we took advantage of the opportunity to revisit the guidebook and make it more useful for folks today. Uh, although it still applies to communities statewide, it updates the original guidebook to focus more specifically on low-income, underserved communities. Um, it provides examples of how communities across the state are using participation tools and techniques, including areas where the California Endowment's Building Healthy Communities programs currently work. The resource is free of charge at lgc.org to any local leader interested in more effectively engaging residents in the planning process. The presentations you're about to hear cover some of the innovative tools discussed in the guidebook. Next slide. Okay, so uh, without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker, James Rojas. Uh, Mr. Rojas is an urban planner, a community activist, and an artist. He holds a master's in city planning from MIT and is an expert in community engagement in the urban planning process. Uh, James, it looks like we're queuing up your presentation, so I will turn it over to you. Okay, so uh, uh, thank you. And uh, imagination shapes cities, and this and imagination becomes the ideal venue to engage community members to uh, talk about urban planning issues. So what I'm what I'm going to talk about is over. The 250 workshops I have facilitated in Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. with uh, and all and all types of uh, uh, venues and activities, and uh, but, but by using by using uh, by having people people build their ideal city. Uh, next, and and because this kind of, this kind of process gives everybody autonomy to to really think about the city and uh, and and really understand it in, in the spatial sense. Because at the end of the day, cities are spatial. And then that's the easiest way to engage people with cities is with with spatial uh, you know, with uh, with objects because uh, maps, pictures, powerpoints just don't just don't people just don't understand this stuff and it's too hard for them to get it. So I could run a workshop within one hour and uh, get get better results really, uh, really thoroughly. So the whole idea is that you know, city charters believes that everyone is is a, is a potential leader, 
I believe everyone is a planner. And it's our job to create the means to engage everybody in the, in the planning process. Next slide. So, so, and the whole idea is that, you know, this started from my research at MIT when I was looking at how Latinos, you know, use public space and how they kind of reinvent the city. But this is all through imagination. Because Latinos come to the U.S. with nothing, just their hands and their minds, and they create. And they create their environment, they create their communities. And this is what, this is the kind of data that as planners we need to know because this is, this is, when we, this is what's going to, this is what's going to shape cities in the future, uh, within our head today, not what's out there right now. So this is a really simple six, seven step process. Next slide. And the, the whole thing starts with a simple question. You know, just ask people to uh, create your ideal city, you know, uh, create your uh, next, you know, create your, uh, your your ideal place, and people from there, you know, can start to, uh, to create a next. You know, it, you know, the whole idea is that, so, so, so it's a question that anybody can answer, and, and uh, people have, uh, you have access to, and uh, and, and then what I do is I, I said, and I get I provide them I provide, I provide materials, you know, to find objects, get people thinking about uh, about, the, about the about the solution they're going to build, and and this and this again these materials give people autonomy to really kind of drive their own ideas about the city and their own experiences, memories, uh, you know, and needs and desires. So again, it gives people autonomy, which kind of get 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 get, get some people get people motivated. Be part of the process. Next, so it happens. People people search these materials and pick up pick up things they like, and uh, and uh, you know their favorite their favorite color, their favorite shapes to help them to help them to help them shape their or build their uh, solution. This is working with the uh, Latinos for political econ political uh, equity. And uh, you know before this, I don't ever thought about urban planning, you know, but having to actually build a solution to their neighborhood. They, they they understood it and they understood how their body and how their lives interact with the built environment in order to shape their the world next. So so during I like I give people twenty minutes to to build their, their solution and during that time people self reflect. You kind of base this on you know on experiences. You know, I was a kid, and I was making a lot in the neighborhood, wanted I wanted to fix, and I could do that. Needs, you know, I have I have a young young child and I needed to watch at school and we need to have safer uh Crosswalk or desires. They've always wanted to live in a in a modern city or the pink city or a green city, and this is how it's going to look. So this so, so this, this this 20 minutes helps people investigate their subconscious and think about uh you know think about their their uh, connections to the built environment next, and and it works really well. People just really get into it really quickly next. So after that, everybody has one minute to present their uh, to present their idea, and what happens is that people. You know, so everybody shares out their one idea because what happens a lot of times when you go to public meetings, you might have 50 people in the room, but only 10 people are talking. Especially with Latinos, they tend to be they tend to be a little more shy. They tend to be shy. So the whole idea is to get everybody to talk, so like get everybody a minute to talk. And uh, you know, for Latinos that might be too long, but it gets them to say a few words. And to an it might be too short, but it keeps the, it keeps the whole it keeps the whole process flowing. And then when you have a you know multicultural, multi generational, multi ethnic group like uh like this last slide in Arizona where we had the where we had the police department working with youth in the neighborhood, they really they really they really that they share they share a lot in common and these and these kind of barriers are broken down and bridges are created. This slide here, this woman created a you know a situation where the whole idea was to how would you improve your community community life? And uh for her it was her family and she said, you know, because a lot of uh Latinos work, they live in Mexico, and work in San Diego. It takes them an hour to cross the border. But she said, "This is my, this is I want to improve border crossing because work workers are coming to work every day, which is, which is a great solution. Because because through, 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 through design, people start to figure out the spatial needs of the city. And I think this is really important because you have you create this third space, you kind of share ideas. Next, so once everybody shares out, you know, uh, you, you know, uh, all their ideas. They're placed in teams, and I, and I, and I have each team. I ask each team to pick a spot in their neighborhood they want to improve with their ideas. So again, you're giving you're giving the participants the autonomy to pick a pick a pick a problem or space or location and pick their solution and develop a solution on their own. I mean, rather than me telling them, you know, we're working on transportation or housing, how the public, you know, kind of uh, have them have them vet their ideas they want to talk about. 
So, so I give people I give people 50 minutes to work together, and through this process, people learn how to uh, you know how to collaborate and how to really share ideas and how to work off each other. And this is where all the real energy and all the real magic happens. So people people tend to investigate again their urban issues and do it through space. Because language is just to abstract and just to dead, you know. So through play and through and through building, people can really share ideas and come up with really really unique solutions next. So during this whole time, you know, I, I, uh, this process here, people do three Latinas. This is all in Spanish and in Van Nuys, and they had them had them design. They chose to do. They chose to redesign their their the Van Nuys Boulevards, the main shopping street in their community, and they did it with bike paths, trees, public art, you know, benches, the street vendors. But again, you know, prior to prior to 20 minutes, 20 minutes beforehand, they had no idea what River Funny was. Given, given this tool, made them realize that, hey, you know, I can design, I can reshape my community in the way I want to see it. That's really helpful. Next. And during this whole time, you know, you document. You document your pictures, notes, and videos. But more importantly, people people, people will remember this workshop because you use all their motor skills. And the more motor skills you, you use, the, the more you can remember the outcomes and the activity. So it's really powerful to, to, to people to remember remember. Uh, you know, you know, their, 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 their urban, urban needs. Uh, next, so the whole idea that you know, so the whole idea that this is really multi-generational. Now, I worked in a, this is a public housing project in South LA, where I worked with pre-K uh, youth children, you know, and having them kind of create their ideal worlds. And again, the school goes, the school goes creating a wedding, you know, and uh, you know, so so again, it kind of give them just take it, it kind of builds this kind of leadership. At a really young age, to really kind of engage in public discourse, and in a way that they, that in a way that they are really passionate and motivated about, and how, and, and also kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of validate their their ideas that their ideas do matter. Next, they also teach a lot of classes with uh, with uh, low income high school kids in LA. You know, taught two or three classes with uh, youth using this method. So I give them a ten minute lecture on bike planning or rail planning or housing or parks and then they have them build it for the next twenty minutes. So what happens is that they you know, they, you know, they they hear this information, these ideas, and then they actually connect it to their own personal lives. You know, how would you build a bike path in East LA? How would you how would you design a park in East LA or a neighborhood? And this kinda of helps them personalize the whole process next. You know, and uh, they're really next they're really successful in that way. Yeah, this is work with the California Endowment, uh uh, one of the grants, uh, building healthy, building healthy, healthy communities in Coachella. We did a series of workshops with different demographics, and this happens to be with uh, senior citizens. So I just asked them, you know, what kind of legacy would you want to leave your kids and grandkids? And these women were just so happy to build these really incredible models of learning, education, religion, space, all this kind of all this kind of stuff. Next, and, and they want they want to they want to do more workshops after next. So, and so, so you can also do this. You can also do what's great about this uh, workshop activity is that you can take it to different sites. You can take it to parks. You know, that was uh, in New York City with the Occupy Wall Street group, and uh, what happened? We put the they did a workshop there, and uh, you know, the the the, the, the you know we, 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 we lay out some materials on the ground, and all the kids in the parks started coming and playing, started building their ideal city, which is really great. And this this is this is a model uh, I put on a lot of boulevards. And usually I do this all, you know, in the neighborhoods, and you know, especially like Latino neighborhoods. People don't ask, the people that will ask me if I'm a street vendor. What, what am I selling? And I tell them this is city planning. And if they say, well, what's city planning? I go, this is a, a whole idea you can shape your neighborhood. And they'll ask me, well, what for? I go, because you can and you should. And then they begin to understand that they do have a kind of, you know, uh, agency to kind of take over and kind of kind of shape their neighborhoods. So this is a good, really good one-on-one. To get people in this brand randomly involved, you know, these people you'll never see a planning meeting, but you'll see them on the street corners on the streets. Next, yeah, this is also working in a in New York. We worked at in the South Bronx in laundromats, you know, where people were there, and uh, we worked, worked with two artists, and uh, we were we were we were interested about you know understanding the Bronx, how people understood the Bronx River, but most of the immigrants at laundromats were from Latin America. And they had no idea where the Bronx River was, but they had ideas about rivers from their home countries. They started designing rivers with palm trees and turtles and rocks and you know, alligators. And, you know, you, consider, you need to realize that their mind is still in Latin America, even though they live in New York. Next. 
So it's a really good way to get to get people to understand people. This is a, one of the models they built to get people uh, you know involved in the planning process. Next, so at least help people really kind of uh, interface kind of activities, and again, it helps them create that third space to really kind of think about it, and really provoke them to think about design. This is working with high school kids again on transportation oriented districts. But I took them out to Pasadena to to look at TODs. I would give them a checklist, you know, count the trees, count the benches. Count the you know the you know, foods and then the stores and then we brought them back we brought them back East LA and told them now redesign your TOD here in by the station and they did but they built models and this was built this is the model built out of candy but during this but through, through this process of the model building they started to investigate architecture and the shape of their community it's really 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 powerful you know what they wanted next you know then working with the uh, you know different different arch this is working with architects in Peru and using the body as a way to engage people next. And this is working in Tijuana, you know, where we worked in Mexico in the Colonia, where the city of Juana built a park. So I went down there and did a we did a workshop where we had in the middle of, right right above the right above the potential park in the, in the dry riverbed. We we had everybody out there, all the women and kids, all the women and kids out there designing their other ideal park next. And to do the workshop, we got like you know five or six pages of notes and videos, and all kinds of great stuff next. And that's what they used to really design the park because you know when they, when they had the public meeting with maps and pictures, nobody said anything. But when once they started to build, it kind of had root. It, it all comes out and it, it all becomes a lot more user next. So so basically, this is a this is the way people uh, you, you know uh, this is a good way to get people to imagine you know an urban planning process. So cause, cause, again, because the, the the economy the economy motivates people. It creates awareness of the built environment. You know, it also it's an inclusive process, multi generational. It creates a space to share ideas. It builds community trust and capacity. Because once I leave that room, I know people have the capacity to plan. Because they all they all talk to each other. And you can be find plan to unconventional places, so rather than having a meeting at a church base when you have it out in the street corner. You know, it provides end up data for plans, policies and projects, which is a lot better than we get from from, from post-it notes or from uh, you know uh, signing sheets and stuff like that, so a lot more interesting. And, and you and you can quickly develop uh, community values. And uh, and this just saves time. So the workshops last an hour or less, and uh, you know, they cost between like two hundred dollars a workshop. You can have hundred people there, and it's a uh, you know less than an hour, and and it gives people really really a productive time because people aren't uh, arguing. They're 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 happy to they're creating, and you have to tap into this whole. This whole high, high energy idea about how you create and how you work, kind of uh, create the energy. Anyways, uh, thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much for that presentation, James. I have no doubt that your approach really resonates with a lot of our participants today. Uh, next up is Claudia Corchado. She's program manager with Health Services Department at United Way of Merced County. Uh, Ms. Corchado is the Merced County Program Manager for the Central California Regional Obesity Prevention Program, also known as CROP, which is part of the California Endowment Building Healthy Communities Initiative. She's worked for the past 13 years in the nonprofit world on grant writing, management, and implementation, and we're excited to have her here today to talk about effective youth engagement and leadership development. So, Claudia, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, and thank you once again for the opportunity um, to present at this webinar. Um, so I'm just going to talk to you guys about the power of photo voice and the power of youth engagement when it comes to city planning, civic engagement for your youth, and really just building communities um, that are healthier in the Central Valley and specifically the low-income rural unincorporated communities of our county. Next. So of course I want to thank our funders um, and like it was mentioned we are part of the Building Healthy Communities and we serve the South, Southeast, Planada, Lee Grand and Beachwood Franklin areas under the uh, Building Healthy Communities Initiative. Next. So one of the challenges we have I'm sure throughout California not just in the Central Valley is 
Um, a lot of our community residents, especially the Latino community, is really not aware of what the purpose of our city council or our, city, our county board of supervisors, what their role is, or really don't understand what the role of even maintaining a park, for example, and who's responsible for the maintenance of that park, or who's responsible for the lack of sidewalks and lightings. So CROP throughout the Central Valley does um, a lot of grassroots civic engagement leadership training to really build up the knowledge and the, um, you know, even the, the self-esteem and the confidence so folks can really um, get more engaged when it comes to civic engagement. Um, and then, of course, when it comes to young people, you know, they're even less aware of what the purpose and role of our city departments are. Next. So any of us that have either teenagers or have worked with young people, we know that we have to have a uh, really good sense of humor. So I found these couple of clips just to uh, remind us that this is how sometimes young people really uh, view us. Next. So one of the tools we used um, you know, as a resource and as a tool, but also to really begin building the relationship with our young people um, is Photo Voice. And I'm sure you've all heard and familiar with Photo Voice projects. And the reason why CROP uses Photo Voice quite a lot, obviously, is for the reasons that you see um, in front of you. But it's also because it's the less expensive. You know, with all the technology that we have now, um, it's very easy and very cost effective to use Photo Voice. Um, in working with you know your city planners or your city or any other you know work that's um, benefiting your community so obviously the low cost nature and the accessibility of foot photography to all ages cultures and skill sets and then the ability of photography to cross cultural and linguistic barriers so you don't have to necessarily speak the language you know to be engaged in photo you in photo voice um, you don't even have to you know, you just point the camera and you take a picture and you make a comment of your photo, whatever that photo represented to you and what you were thinking when you took the photo. So it really does um, encompass a lot of our community residents because you could stay anonymous if you wanted to, um, but it really does resonate because there is no language barriers and it's really open and free to capture whatever photo and the moment and your thought while you took that photo. Next. So here are a couple of examples, um, and this is from our regional office from Stockton. So obviously you see that the youth, they take the photo and then they sort of tell their little story underneath the photo. So what they saw at the moment, um, what they were feeling, what that photo signifies to them. So obviously if you take a look at the photo in the middle, you see all of the tagging, which obviously gives a feeling that there's gang members around, um, and of course it creates this environment that it's not safe to be participating in that park. And so you see the photo and it's very obvious to you know our stakeholders that that is a challenge and this is the message and this is the environment that our youth are living in. Next. And so some of these photos I also wanted to share with you guys because I mean, even though our work is around obesity prevention, it really is around civic engagement and the youth development. The photo that you see to your left, that's a young man from our Planada community. His name is Ricardo. And of course, it broke my heart because when he saw himself reflected in that mirror, he pictured himself behind bars, not at a university because we are home of UC Merced. It was, look, I look like I am in prison or I am in jail. So he captured that photo and he called it behind bars. And I, I don't think I need to explain any more that photo because that piece is very powerful. The one um, to the right is a water booth that you see a lot in our low income communities. And so this one, they called it the water demons because they said in all of the movies, there's always these demons that were you know, trying to challenge and trying to fight and trying to beat. 
And so, of course, their comment was, why do we even have to pay for water? Why isn't the water that comes out of our faucet safe enough to drink? So they're really targeting um, those Latino communities to come out and buy water when their stance is, why can't we just drink the water that's coming out of our faucets? Next. And then one of the other uh, little fun things that we do with the Photo Voice Project is we do scavenger hunt. So we give them a list of go out in your community and try and capture positive messaging, capture something that is encouraging you to go to higher education, capture something that's healthy eating, um, try and capture when your bus transportation schedule um, goes through your community. So you can come into the city of Merced and then go back home. Um, and of course, it's very challenging in some of our low-income communities. Like I said, um, the top photo, you see that it is the Pepsi, and then we have the other high sugar sweetened beverages that are promoting the low cost of um, sodas, but no sign for water. And then in these communities, you see additional high sugar sweetened beverages that are targeted to Latino communities. So you see the horchata and the additional juices um, off to the left. Next. This is, after we take the photos, what we do is we blow up the pictures. Um, we were lucky enough that this community of Planada had some previous sort of goals and um, planning that they had developed to better, to make the community a lot more safer to walk or ride their bicycles. And so we took all of the photos that we took throughout the community and we had a little booth at uh, a transportation forum in Planada. And the bottom, the picture that you see on the bottom is uh, one of our county planners. So you see really comparing their community as it looks today and of course the uh, beautiful artwork of what they'd like to see um, in some of their streets and their neighborhoods. Next. And then, real quickly, because I know we're short on time, I'm going to uh, just describe to you another way that we engaged our youth um, in city planning. So the city of Merced had a proposal to close off four of the streets in downtown to make it more walkable and more green space. Next. We rounded up about youth, about 30 young people um, with our city planner, and so they really provided an information and input on what they wanted to see if that downtown park um, would come to life in the city of Merced. Next. So we broke up into groups and they identified um, sort of solutions, what they like to see, we took in consideration what some of their parks look like now, um, what they should look like, and then, of course, brought it into the planning piece uh, with the city planner. Next. And then, of course, they sort of broke them up into sections to, you know, if they wanted, um, you know, water parks or if they wanted more slides. And so they broke them up into different sectors. And then, of course, the, the more um, that the youth sort of rounded up, and that became sort of their ten, top 10 goals that they wanted to see in the park. Next. And then we also collected um, surveys, community surveys. So they went out and they collected community surveys at different fairs, outreach, downtown events for the community that asked the community what they would like to see in the downtown park. Next. And then to, um, oops, can we pop up the photos? Our surprise, our youth, the top 10 were, they wanted solar lighting so the lights would stay on a lot longer and it wouldn't cost the city so much money. They wanted recyclable turf um, for basketball courts. They wanted clean restrooms um, at the park. And they wanted a little water park for their little brothers and sisters. And clean drinking water came up, I believe, like 47 times. Um, so clean drinking water obviously was very important. And so this is sort of their goals that they wanted to see in the downtown 
part. Next. Um, I added some links to our Merced Sunstar because we've had some other successes when we engage youth. Our city of Merced is now um, taking on a youth task force and so the task force will be made up of youth throughout the city of Merced to really help city um, engage more youth, create more youth opportunities, um, and reduce violence throughout. Next. Just recently, the youth also organized a uh, candidates forum, and so these are some of the folks that are running for city council and for our mayor of Merced. So the questions were all um, asked by youth, and they were written by the youth, and so it was really a conversation between the city council candidates and um, our youth, and asked, overall question was, how are we going to make the city of Merced safer? And how are we going to create more opportunities for youth to be engaged? Next. And some other quick youth um, engage, engagement successes that we've had in the past is we recently received a um, grant that's going to help alleviate all of this chaos at Beachwood Franklin School. Um, how do we make that community walkable? and more bikeable and alleviate a lot of this traffic congestion. Next. We've established a little Junior Giants program also in the Beachwood Franklin area where we have some of our youth that are coaching some of the younger youth teams. Next. We've established a farmer's market that runs five months out of the year in the other community of Lee Grand. Next. We've created joint use opportunities where one of our schools in South Merced opens up their gymnasium and we still continue to have a little over 100 folks that come work out three times a week and we've been running that program now a little over a year. Next. And folks, you know, all of this work does sometime say that you have to take the shovel yourself and so this is a group of our youth and community residents um, making or creating the baseball fields for the Junior Giants. So sometimes we do have to get a little dirty in this work. Next. And so I thank you for the opportunity. I know it was a little quick, but I'm trying to save a couple of minutes for our next presenter. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation, Claudia. Great to hear about all your insights from working with youth and to think about planning from a, a different perspective. Uh, I just want to remind folks that although you're muted, you can post any questions or comments using the chat feature. Uh, even if we can't respond now in the webinar, we can capture your input and try to respond afterwards. Our final speaker today is Hector Rojas. Mr. Rojas is a graduate of UC Berkeley and is currently a senior planner at the City of Richmond's Planning and Building Services Department. He worked for the city for the past eight years and his recent work includes managing Richmond's general plan update, which includes one of the first community health and wellness elements in the country. Uh, Hector, it looks like we have your slides pulled up so you can go ahead whenever you're ready. It's great. Thanks, Atisha, and hi, everyone. I'd like to start by thanking uh, the Local Government Commission for this opportunity to present, and especially the California Endowment for allowing us to be a part of the Building Healthy Communities Initiative. Today I'll be sharing the City of Richmond's experience with an innovative outreach tool we use during the community visioning process for the Richmond General Plan update. For those of you not familiar with general plans, they are state-mandated planning documents adopted by cities that set forth a vision for the future based on a set of shared community values. General plans are important because all city decision making related to things like economic development, human services, land use, housing, transportation, infrastructure, open space, and public safety has to be consistent with its general plan. The last time Richmond had updated its general plan was in 1994 and the city was very eager to update the plan because it was ready to move away from permitting auto-centric suburban development. It wanted to move towards building healthy, sustainable neighborhoods 
characterized by things like high density, mixed use housing, as well as bike and pet friendly streets. When the Richmond City Council authorized the general plan work, they made it very clear to us that they wanted Richmond's new general plan to be inclusive. They wanted it to reflect more than just the vision of a few people that show up to city council meetings every Tuesday night. They were more particularly interested in having the general plan address the needs and visions of those who have not historically been part of, a, of community planning, the youth, the quote unquote ethnic minorities, and people from economically disadvantaged backgrounds. Next slide. For those of you not familiar with Richmond, we're a city of 103,000 people. The city covers 34 square miles of land, and we have a 32 mile shoreline that overlooks the San Francisco Bay. We're a diverse community of Latinos, African Americans, and Asians making up over 75% of the population. Over 30% are foreign born and over 40% speak a foreign language at home. About 20% of residents possess less than a high school education and the median household income is 54,000. Now as part of our larger community outreach program, we employed many of the tools discussed in the LGC handbook. Things like forming a technical advisory committee, hosting the, a community visioning, a set of community visioning planning workshops, and focus group meetings organized around specific topics, as well as developing a website where people could get general information and sign up for ongoing updates. But in order to have the process be inclusive, we knew we had to do more than just set up meetings, notify people through mailed notices, and hope that people would come out to us with their ideas directly. Instead, we knew we, had, we would have to take the general plan directly to our neighborhoods in a way that would be most convenient for people that typically don't make it out to meetings because of things like language barriers and competing priorities like work and children. Hopefully this map will give you a sense of the challenge we immediately ran into. As we can see here, Richmond is quite large geographically. The city contains over 30 distinct neighborhoods, each with its own identity and set of issues. Next slide. Our general plan consultant, the Berkeley-based firm of Moore, Isofano, and Goldsman, MIG, came up with an innovative way to tackle this challenge. They suggested the city could set up what they referred to as a rolling workshop as a way to establish a presence at locations where we'd have easy access to the every, everyday kind of people we were looking for. And so the plan van was born. It consisted of an underutilized eight-passenger van borrowed from our city's public work department. We took out six of the seats, leaving behind plenty of cargo space for on-the-go workshop materials, and the city cleaned the exterior and wrapped the van with custom vinyl graphics in keeping with the general plan's project branding. Now many of us planners felt the finished product looked pretty cool, and some of the neighborhood kids apparently thought so too. They actually thought the plan van looked kind of sort of like a Scooby-Doo mystery machine. Next slide. The plan van was staffed by one bilingual city planner and up to two volunteers from the community. The volunteers were primarily students from Richmond's local high schools. City staff educated the volunteers about the project and various urban planning issues facing Richmond. They were trained to facilitate each of the van's workshop activities and were provided with branded staff t-shirts. Having student volunteers that youth could relate to proved to be very important in this process. During our year-long community visioning process, we did over 50 mobile workshops out of the plan van. Venues included each of Richmond's neighborhoods, schools, church, churches, I'm sorry, shopping centers, farmers markets, and community events like our Cinco de Mayo parade and festival. At each workshop, we parked the van in a highly visible location and set up a large velvet covered table adjacent to the van and project banner. The table included bilingual handouts, providing project information and contact information for various neighborhood services of interest and giveaways with general plan branding and website information. During school events, the plan van, was, uh, plan van workshops were held in the school cafeteria and, city, and the city provided free ice cream for students who participated. Next slide. One of the more important handouts we provided during the plan van events was our general plan newsletter that also went out to residents citywide through mail. The newsletter was important because it served as the basis for discussion with each resident at plan van events 
and it was something they could take home with them and read at their leisure. Next slide. The newsletter described the general plan's importance, listed upcoming community workshop dates, and even included simulations of what future development in their neighborhoods could look like under the general plan. The plan band staff used a variety of activities to solicit comments from members of the community. This included quick questionnaires, mapping exercises, community character preference surveys, and comment cards. Next slide. This is a questionnaire we included in the, in the newsletter. The questions were designed to be simple and perhaps serve as a basis for expanded conversations with plan band staff. The questions we asked were, what do you think are the best things about living in Richmond? What do you think are the major obstacles to a better future in Richmond? And what changes do you think are needed to make Richmond a better place? Plan band staff encouraged people to fill out these on the spot. And to our surprise, we were able to get hundreds of people to provide comments in this fashion. Next slide. Here's an example of one of our mapping exercises we did at some of the larger citywide events like the Cinco de Mayo Festival. In this activity, we asked people to map where they felt Richmond's needs and assets were. At smaller neighborhood plan van stops, a more neighborhood-centric map was used. The neighborhood-specific mapping exercise was our most affected by far because it sparked broader, more detailed conversations with plan van staff about things that people felt were needed to be more, felt people I'm sorry, that uh, people felt needed to be more, uh, there needed to be more of, like improved housing, access to transportation, and grocery stores, and better lighting, and things people wanted to see less of, like liquor stores, crime, and general bright, blight. I'm sorry. Next slide. Another activity plan band staff utilized was the community character preference survey. This activity really helped us convey to people what general, the general plan was all about, shaping the, re, the built environment. I'd like to end here by saying that the city felt its outreach process for the general plan was very successful and inclusive, largely due to the different approach we took with the general plan ban. And I would highly recommend you all consider this as a potential tool for use in your community engagement process. Overall, the city hosted over 150 community meetings involving the participation of over 2,000 community members. A large cross-section of participants were exactly the kind of people we were hoping to hear from, and their participation didn't end with the closure of the general plan visioning process. We repeatedly saw people we had met during the plan ban events attend the later public hearings leading up to the adoption of the, of the document. Um, with that, I'd like to conclude my presentation. I know um, I, I sprinted through the presentation, so I wanted to make sure to um, allow people uh, some time to ask questions given our technical difficulties earlier. Well, thanks so much for that presentation, Hector. A lot of great information and visuals there. Um, looking through our chat feature, I see that um, we have one question coming in here. It is, how are these individual concepts consolidated into a few viable options that the community can then select from? Uh, so we're going to unmute our speakers here. And if you have any comments to that uh, question, we're unmuted. please feel free to answer. Does, it, does anyone have any comments, or do you need to hear the... I'm sorry, Atisha. I, I, I personally didn't hear the question. Can you repeat it? Sure, yeah, please. Sure. How are these individual concepts no. consolidated into a few viable options that the community can then select from? Yeah, I think you need to have all the, use all the options. It's like multimodal planning. You need to have you need to have all the different options out there to get, to get, to get, to get a really broad section of people involved. Yeah, I, I would agree with James. I think that um, you know none of these by themselves um, will really, you know, prove to be effective in trying to get the um, the information that you're trying to uh, to get from the community. I think that um, as long as you uh, mix in different tools here, that um, you'll you'll get a variety of comments. Um, I I personally was listening to um, to Claudia's presentation and thought that uh, I'd, I'd probably be using the photo voice myself in, in an upcoming project. 
Um, so I, I would agree that you know combining a lot of these uh, tools is is a good idea. Yeah, and just to add, it's it's a great way to start even engaging not just youth but your community residents and and guiding them to help understand what city planning um, is about and how it impacts them you know in their neighborhoods in their local parks on their way to school so it, it really is a great tool to um, begin that conversation and could be step one of a lot of other more civic engagement tools Great, thanks for those responses. And we have another question. Uh, Claudia, this looks like it's for you. Can you share the survey instrument that was used on the downtown park in Merced? Absolutely, yes. I'll email it to you and then you can share it with the rest of the group. Sure, sounds good. Mm -hmm. And this question is for Hector. How did your plan van staff record comments and ideas they got from the public? Um, we, we recorded those primarily using notepads. Um, we also utilized, um, in some cases, recording devices. And the activities um, themselves were really useful. I think, um, for example, the uh, mapping exercise, um, the, the one I provided was probably not the best example of this because it only showed the dots, um, but it was at a higher citywide level. Um, in a lot of the neighborhood-specific events that we held throughout you know, those, those 30 different neighborhoods that we have, um, we had a blown up map of the specific neighborhood where we were at and in addition to the dots um, we would have people um, put on the map uh, were comments next to the to the dots um, so that was one I you know one one way we did that we also um, provided a comment sheet um, that was kind of double-sided and had some questions and also had uh, you know just a general area where people could you know write down anything related to the city that they felt um, needed to be addressed Great. Great. And we have uh, another question that looks like could go to all three of our presenters. It says, how do we develop policies that require this level of public engagement rather than the bare minimum that we often see in practice? And then there's a, a follow-up that says, and how can this be funded as the lack of community engagement often comes from small planning budgets? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll kind of address that from, from our perspective. Um, our city council, we have the benefit of, of uh, having a really proactive city council that really cares about um, you know, the community and really wants us to integrate and have plans be reflective of community thoughts. Um, I think that, number one, is, is really helpful um, if you're you know, a local government. Um, other things that really help as well is, uh, for example, the California Endowment and some of the other um, funding partners that we've gone through at least um, have very specific requirements about um, equi equitable development and um, you know inclusive uh, uh, you know community participation so it, it almost is basically a requirement um, that these processes be you know so involved with the community uh, but I would say if you have a, a government that really you know um, or, or actually even if you can identify community groups nonprofits in, in your areas that are really yeah. kind of stakeholders um, mm -hmm. That really helps as well, and you know they, you know one person from a neighborhood uh, at a city council meeting might not be much, but um, having a nonprofit that you can band, um, you know, together with um, other community stakeholders um, at a city council meeting, kind of demanding that these things be inclusive is very powerful. Yeah, also, also in my work, I partner with a lot of artists, a lot of art grants because uh, you know imagination is free. And basically, a lot of artists and communities are engaging the public because art's all about engagement, and they do that for a living. So, so, so they know how exactly to engage people, so they can really cost, provide really low-cost solutions to public engagement that their planners don't really think about. So again, just I guess partnering, partnering with the community art community, so that the artists would be really an inexpensive way to get these ideas out there, and also to really uh, because I think the more effective your policies are, you know, the more effective your engagement is the better off your policy is going to be in the long run. Yeah, and I have to agree, too, that um, partnering with nonprofit organizations that already have relationship with your community residents um, is very important. I'm, I'm not saying that city staff, you know, doesn't know how to work with community residents, but 
you know, it, it is the work that nonprofits do. We have more experience, and so we sort of serve as the liaison between the city um, and the community. And of course, you know, we, we have the liberty also to provide transportation for the community residents. We have the resources to provide childcare for residents. You know, all of those things that make it easier for the community to get engaged. And, and I understand the question because sometimes it's like, how did you engage community residents in this grant? And so, you know, you sort of just come up with stuff versus demonstrating and proving that this community has been engaged for the past two years. You know, I would say, um, too, as far as the nonprofits are concerned, they, they really help kind of leverage the top, you know, it really helps to leverage the trust that they've kind of built with um, their mm -hmm. community members. And people tend to be, you know, a lot more involved because of that. Great, a lot of great input there. And I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. We have one, again, for all three speakers. Could each speaker give an idea of the cost associated with the community engagement they did? Okay, so my workshop cost, it cost uh, $20 a, a workshop. That's the cost of the whole process. Um, for you, yeah, I know. For um, photo voice folks, again, it's you know, even with disposable cameras now, disposable cameras cost like six, seven bucks each. Um, but, you know, most young people that we work with already have like the smartphone. So they'll take a photo and they'll, you know, text it to me or via email. And that doesn't cost, you know, anything. So the only thing it costs would be just, you know, some of your staff time. Yeah, and as far as... Um... Richmond's concerned. Uh, our overall general plan effort, including the development of uh, of the plan and the program environmental impact report, was you know to the order of about a million dollars. Um, so it was, it was a huge undertaking. I don't recall because it was about like five years ago that we started the the project. How much of it was dedicated to specifically to outreach? But it's something I could definitely um, you know mail out and, and research a little bit further. As far as the um, the plan van itself and and what we were doing with that, um, all the, uh, the the staff, it was uh, staff time. Um, it was me personally, I, I was a city planner that was assigned to the uh, plan van. And then uh, there was other community members that were high school um, students. And that was, uh, you know, free of charge uh, community volunteer time. Um, as far as the wrapping is concerned in the graphics, um, the vehicle was brought over by our, um, from our public works department. Um, so I don't think that there was a cost other than ongoing cost there. Um, I think the wrapping, the graphic wrapping, probably cost between, I would say, five hundred to fifteen hundred dollars. But um, again, it's it's something we did a while ago, so I'm not I'm not particularly keen on exactly how much it would cost. Okay. Well, again, um, we we'll try to capture all these uh, comments and provide feedback. Uh, after the webinar, but we, we've reached our uh, end time here. So I want to thank all of our presenters once again, and thanks definitely to our participants for hanging in there and uh, bearing with the technical difficulties of the survey as you exit the webinar. So thanks again, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And Thank you. Have a great afternoon.